Vítáme vás u dalšího dílu podcastu Insider, který moderuju já, Michal Tůr a můj kolega je Tomáš Jirsa. Dobrý den. Na začátek pár obligátních vzkazů. Partnerem tohoto podcastu je American Academy, americká mezinárodní základní střední škola v Praze, projektová výuka zahraniční učitele, výuka STEM a studium pouze v angličtině, advokátní kancelář Rowan Legal. Každou středu poslouchejte, a někdy i čtvrtek, a někdy i úterý poslouchejte náš formát Insider Briefing, kde se věnujeme různým aktuálním věcem. A dneska máme speciální díl, kdy jsme tady v kumbálku, v improvizovaném studiu na Shifts, Prague 23, což je taková velká konference, která nás konfrontuje s děním ve světě. A my jsme si tady trošku vynutili jednoho z nejzajímavějších speakerů a hostů. Kdo to je? Je to uh, Sir Alex Younger, nejdéle sloužící šéf britské rozvědky SI, je známé též jako MI6 od roku 2014 do roku 2020. Uh, byl důstojníkem MI6 na Blízkém východě. Uh, so, Sir Alex, it's great to have you here. Welcome to Prague. It's good to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my question: We had a we had a prep call for the conference for your speech, keynote speech, um, and it was I I believe it was Thursday before the hell broke loose on in in, yeah. in the Middle East, and it yeah. all seemed, you know, um, situation is pretty stable. Ukraine is kind of tiring people. It's you know it's two years ongoing, everybody's used to it uh, in Europe, and it all started shifting towards business as usual, and then this happened. So how how big of a shift, if the conference mm. is called shift, yeah. does it represent? Uh, this is the depressing thing, uh, Thomas, it's not a shift at all. So uh, I'll talk today about things that are, and the way in which I think we're at, the, at a turning point in some really important um, phases uh, represented by the rise of China and the nihilism of Vladimir Putin. But this has been going on for a very long time. And the only surprising thing really is how we've been able to ignore this situation and convince ourselves that, you know, that it had gone away. And uh, that was self-evidently not the case. Now, I'm as guilty as everybody else when we were talking. I probably was feeling quite optimistic at the time, given the process of normalization, the Abraham Accords taking place, particularly between Saudi Arabia and Israel. It felt in some ways like we were, we were at the dawn of something changing. But of course, we've been violently and horribly reminded that that is not the case. This, this is not uh, something that will solve itself. Yeah. My, look, I see in my, in Czech public discourse, two general views. One is, we had 30 years in our case, uh, after the, the fall of communism, mm -hmm. of peace, growth, stability, uh, international order, and it's over. It's over, uh, and the era of uncertainty, of, of wars around us and security threats rising. The other view is uh, it's business as usual. Okay, there's war in Ukraine, you know, some shake up in the Middle East, but overall we'll just go through it and, you know, it's, it's, it's not a big shift. So, so where you stand in between those two quite opposing views? <clears throat> it's, it's, I'm afraid to say, a mixture. So, um, <clears throat> I have a background as an intelligence officer, a spy, and that has had two effects on me. One, an understanding that this idea, the thing you were just talking about, Thomas, that history had ended, okay? Yeah. <laughs> that democracy had triumphed, that we were pits in some postmodern world. I've always known that that wasn't true, okay? In my world, Vladimir Putin or our other adversaries They didn't get the memo about, about, about <laughs> the triumph. <laughs> triumphing. And we were in a pretty well constant struggle, really, since the beginning of this century. So this idea that, that a postmodern world where you could separate geopolitics and economics never felt very real to me. And therefore, the fact that history hasn't ended, we're back in a time of ideological contest, this feels to me like... The, This, this is the normal, and it was the past that was the, the, the recent 30-year past that was the abnormal. But secondly, I am a human intelligence officer, and um, uh, that 
actually imbues you with great faith about the power of individuals to change things. The whole business model was based on the small group of people making a very big difference. Yeah. And I see all around me that happening. Uh, and the 30 years of freedom you have enjoyed here is arguably that happening. And it is impossible not to be fundamentally optimistic when you look at the intrinsic strengths that have driven this amazing period. So I don't think there's any scope for, for complacency, and we need to understand um, the challenges that exist around us. But um, you know, my, my advice always is actually we need to remember the things that keep us uh, make us strong, and we need to double down on them. You know, and I, I, I know what they are, and we need to use them. So you've you've spent many years in the Middle East. Uh, there are some debates about the, the situation that uh, if it is. The, if the situation will evolve to the regional war or mm. will it be just the, the case of Gaza Strip? Uh, how bad is the situation? Because my wife often asks me yeah. how bad it is. And <laughs> yeah. I, I am not able to give her an honest yeah. answer because it feels like you are on the brink of World War Three, mm -hmm. as I would say. You can't tell her. I think that it could be bad, but I think that people are working quite hard to ensure that it isn't more, perhaps, than I would have expected. So, you know, why did Hamas do this? Well, it's a good question. It's an act of nihilism, really. But, of course, terrorism isn't the action in the end. Appalling, though, this action is. It's the reaction. They're attempting to stimulate a reaction from Israel and the Israeli government that essentially um, throws... Uh, the, re the, well, the country and then the region into turmoil, thus improving their position. I think this is the warped logic that is in their head. So this question of escalation is fundamentally something uh, Hamas is seeking to achieve. And I think both the Israeli government and the American government understand that. So uh, the Israeli government are enraged, the Israeli people are enraged. Um, this is an act of terrorism, pure and simple, and, and they will, and I believe that they have the right to strike very hard against Hamas to destroy the infrastructure that allowed this to happen. Um, I hope, though, and, and, and I believe, in fact, they will understand that they can't just respond to the script that Hamas is writing for them, and that this needs to be done in a way that doesn't make the situation even worse. Because to answer your question, um, uh, if this leads to uh, the, uh, a broader uh, uprising uh, in Israel involving the groups in the West Bank and then pulling in Hezbollah, you are in a very dangerous situation at the moment. Uh, if that happens, looked at from an Israeli perspective, you've got three issues. You've got Hamas, you've got the West Bank, and you've got Hezbollah, all of which basically have Iranian support. And Iran starts to be the consistent problem that you face. And I think the risks of escalation in those terms become higher. Uh, also, of course, there is the possibility that something emerges that demonstrates that Iran actively directed the attack from Gaza, which I think would also be extremely incendiary. At the moment, it doesn't look like that intelligence exists, and I hope it doesn't exist. And in practice, I believe that Iran are responsible. They trained and financed Hamas. I don't actually believe that they direct their their operational activity, but we will see. Um, I started to become nervous when the when the United States decided to move uh, the second ship, mm. uh, the, the carrier, mm. to the air, which signifies some, you know, that it it is maybe a level up in in seriousness and, and you know in ge geopolitical scale. So how, how you kind of um, uh, said it, you don't think there is. It's, it's a very coordinated and, and, and synchronized attack, but it's it's hard to resist this kind of idea that, you know, with all the traditional adversaries and allies and Vladimir Putin struggling in Ukraine and, and the situation being kind of deadlocked, China trying to, you know, outmaneuver the U.S. globally, and then suddenly you have this kind of big escalation that draws a lot of power from, from American military and, and Europe as well. And you really have to focus and, and kind of drain your resources. Is there, is there any, um, 
idea. Maybe maybe it's maybe it's purely on ideological level. But do you see this, this kind of possible synchronization of of these you know traditional adversaries yeah. of the West? No, I don't think that's what's happening. One of the uh, one of the uh, insights you get from thirty years intelligence is is it's normally not a conspiracy. It's okay. normally a cook up. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm not sure if this is if this is like calming. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. So and, and I, I I mean actually, it, uh, bottom line is I think that um, Hamas never expected to be this successful. Oh. So a set of um, essentially accidents um, uh, meant that uh, Israel was not well prepared for what happened. I think everybody missed the change in the quality of the capabilities that Hamas bring to this. Hamas is actually acting out of weakness, essentially. This wasn't a sign of strength. They're mm. feeling marginalized, particularly yeah. in the context of the Abraham Accords. I think they achieved much, they, it was sort of catastrophically achieved, overachieved in their operational objectives and set us on the cycle, which we're now on. Uh, I think you should be reassured by the presence of the um, two, now two carrier groups in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, the reality is um, carry groups are not useful when you're hunting down terrorists. But when you're looking at a quasi-state structure like Hezbollah, they're an excellent way of deterring what might happen next. And, and it's Hezbollah, I emphasise this, it's Hezbollah's entry into this that, that, bring to, that brings that is going to worry your wife, and quite rightly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, so, uh, and, and and that is that is a parastatal unit that you can deter through the through the threat of the use of, of air power. As to how all this fits together, um, I, I don't think there's any sort of idea of um, of coordination. But to be absolutely sure, to your point, Thomas, it will be exploited to the full. Yeah. And and in this axis of resistance, as it's now called, which is North Korea. Iran and Russia, you have those three countries now bound together in their opposition to everything the West stands for. It, it's very noticeable. Russia's taken a surprisingly hard line. Normally they try to play both ends, but they've been really clear this is um, you know, Israel's fault and they're supporting the, that what, what has happened. And that, um, that is a sign that they see an opportunity for sure. Um, how do you interpret the, the, what people perceived as a very ambivalent approach of Israel uh, to the, the situation in Ukraine, which mm. was probably understandable with the explanation in the region and situation in Syria and uh, all of this and need to have some communication channel with the Russians. Yeah. So in, in that context, now this very, I would say, firm and very clear yeah. message that the Russians are yeah. sending, how... how well, in a sense, I, I, I would hope that that reveals to the Israeli government the... Uh, the need to take a position. So they, you know, I, I, I've, I've been very clear with them. It, it, it is a mistake yeah. to try to, um, play, to uh, uh, what, you, you have to have a pragmatic relationship with Russia, for sure, everybody needs to do that. Yeah. But you need to understand what, you, what you've got here. Now, the, the, the consistent argument that Israel employs in these circumstances, which is um, a function of, of its terrible history, is that it has a particular duty to manage its security environment. Um, the reality is, uh, because Russia has a dominant position in Syria, they have to find ways of at least coordinating. There's a very significant Russian diaspora, and, and, and. But yeah, I think this is an example. But ultimately, Vladimir Putin's regime is not a regime that you can even find a, really a tenuous set of, of reasons to work with. Yeah. Head of uh, head of Shin Bet Intelligence yeah. Service yeah. Uh, said yesterday that it was his failure, his personal favor that a uh, failure that this happened. Uh, do you see that as an honest answer? Well, it's a it's a brave answer and it's a dignified answer. Um, in fact, I think it's more complicated than that. And by the way, the whole sort of concept of talking about intelligence failures is something that makes me very uncomfortable. You know, I am a former practitioner. Yeah, yeah. And whilst um, I believe we should all acknowledge um, failures when they occur, uh, the one thing that we all have sitting in our nice seats in this warm studio <laughs> that you do not have at the time is hindsight. And we need to be very careful using the judgment of hindsight. <laughs> it is not available. You know, I, I, I was um, uh, in charge of our counterterrorism 
efforts for a long time uh, and you do not have hindsight. You have to go in a very uncertain and difficult and dusty and muddy uh, environment. And that is where these people are working all the time. Now, it, clearly, uh, at the sort of technical level, there do appear to have been a, a set of issues, and I imagine that is what he is alluding to. But really, if you if you look at this step back, it's not it's not just an intelligence failure; it's an imagination failure. You know, the real, reality is that seventy percent of the IDF was in the West Bank when this happened. There was, I think, a sense. Uh, uh, a, a, um, a conflation of, of what the Israeli government wanted to be true and what was true. <laughs> they wanted Gaza to be on the back, back burner <laughs> so that they could focus uh, on a, a, a set of more political agendas that they had in, in the West Bank. And of course, the chaos, the squabbling in the Israeli government cannot have helped when it came to allowing people to focus on their job. So um, I think it's more complicated than, than a, a technical failure on the part of the intelligence services. Uh, when we look at a, the broader picture, um, do you think we, the, the real shift is that in perception of people like Vladimir Putin or terrorists from Hamas or you know, anybody uh, opposed to, to what we enjoy here in, in the West, uh, we... Uh, all these things, either Ukraine and uh, all, the, all this testing of, of our willingness to, to invest in our defense, uh, came at a moment where, where they sensed pretty rationally that Europe with maybe its very nice and uh, very ambitious plans for you know, Green Deal and the future that will be absolutely different uh, uh, while being extremely dependent on, on Russian yeah. uh, supply. Uh, maybe Israel being torn between, you know, not civil um, unrest, but the, the very, very weakening process of, 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 of protests against the government yeah. and internal disputes. So is this the time where the, the enemies kind of sense the, the very fragile, very open wounds that they can exploit? Yeah, I think... That there's something in that. Um, I um, I know that Vladimir Putin uh, thought said that the U.S. was in the same state a couple of years ago when Donald Trump was in charge that the Soviet Union had been in before it fell apart. He had convinced himself okay. that the dysfunction he saw in Washington was a sign of an underlying weakness. Now that is obviously completely wrong, but that is the way that his mind works. Xi Jinping for his part, is genuinely, he's more sincere than Vladimir Putin. He genuinely believes that socialism with Chinese characteristics is emerging as, as a superior alternative to what we talk of as liberal democracy. That, that is not actually synthetic. He, he, he thinks that. Now, um, some things have emerged to prove those assumptions wrong, and uh, specifically in the context of the Ukraine war. So my colleagues and I, you know, we were very clever. We predicted exactly when Putin was going to do this and told the world, you know, clever us. But what we didn't predict, or certainly what I did not predict, was the quality of the European response. Of course, initially, Zelensky's uh, astonishing discovery of his leadership yeah. talents and his ability to pull Ukraine together. But also, if you remember that speech that um, uh, Olaf Schultz made on the first Saturday where he talked about Zeitenwende and all of these things. And the reality is Europe, the European Union, the transatlantic alliance has proved to be far more coherent and far tougher uh, than I expected and crucially than Vladimir Putin expected. So the terrible irony of what you've just said <laughs> is if they had actually understood how strong we were, and if we had understood how strong we were, mm. this wouldn't have happened. So you're completely correct. In, in a set of, frankly, um, appeasement measures, if for Georgia and in Crimea and in Syria, we sent a strong signal to Russia that we weren't prepared to stand up for the things that we believed in. Yeah. And it turned out, ironically, that we were. Yeah. Do you believe we will be able to keep the quality? in our response, to keep the quality in our response to, to the Ukraine conflict? Well, I'm, I'm super focused on this, and I've always worried that somehow the sort of governments and elites of Europe in particular are ahead of their people in all of this. But I, I, I don't know what you guys think, but, you know, after two years of this, it actually seems that there is a real resilience here, and the energy crisis has 
enacted a real toll on people's livelihoods. And yet, broadly speaking, support is, is staying strong. Now, I think we are in for a very political year next year as it emerges that there isn't a, a military solution to this close at hand. And given the position that the, some of the Republicans are taking in Washington. But I don't know about you, my expectations have been exceeded when it comes to popular willingness to support this. We, I, I, I come from a small village in, in the east of England, and um, every second flag on the high street is a Ukrainian flag. Nice. And those flags are still there. Wow. Uh, um, I think um, we feel the same, and the Czech, the Czech Republic is, I would say, very exceptional in, in, in public support. It's, it's overwhelming. It's, mm. I don't know, between 18 and 90 yeah. percent. Uh, I think Czech government was the first in line to actually sit on a train and go to Kiev and yeah. uh, when everybody else yeah. was afraid. Yeah. And I think Britain played, even outside the EU, a very significant role. I think they've named a street after Boris Johnson. Yeah. Oh, in Kiev. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, I mean, he was he was a big supporter. He was right there up up, up yeah. until now. Uh, but the the um, yeah the sense that I have is the there was this crucial month at the start where nobody really knew what what Germany is going to do. Mm. It was very mm. open and question. Mm. And uh, from that moment, we see what you're talking about is kind of unity. Uh, but still, there are, I would say, worrying signs. One is the absolute reliance on American presence and, and you know, and inability. I mean, again, I would say that in the Czech Republic, we, we just made a decision to buy the F-35s and, and invest heavily in our, our army, as maybe Poland did. But uh, overall around Europe, if you look at the state of, of armies, of the defense structures, uh, it's, it's a sad outlook <laughs> and uh, and um, I think people when faced with increasing costs uh, and hard decisions because it's either we buy the f-35s or maybe we spend on healthcare or you know other other things uh, so that that will create a big tension and uh, I think it's uh, you know but from my point of view the it's there's really mixed signals from the European leadership uh, with regards to this, maybe the Green Deal and its uh, adapting to reality uh, and you know support for for or humanitarian aid for for Palestine and so so uh, it's it's isn't it still that you kind of don't have this one number to call somebody in Europe and and get a, a decision isn't that the problem? Yeah, I, I mean it's undeniable that the. Um the situation in Washington, well, it must be the thing, the most, the thing that preoccupies Zelensky more than anything else. And there is this extreme possibility of Donald Trump getting elected, and that is perfectly likely that he gets elected, and then following through on uh, some of the promises he's made to stop the war on day one, which can only mean stopping it on Russian terms. And that would be a disaster for Europe, because, as I think we've all agreed, stopping the war on Russian terms isn't going to make our continent less dangerous is going to make it more dangerous because it will vindicate what he's done. And this is, you know, very clearly unfinished business. Now, a, a lot would depend on whether Donald Trump followed through. I mean, the, the reality is that the um, it, it would embolden China, amongst other things, and that's something he apparently cares about. So, so who knows if the rhetoric will match. And also, the really big one is what stopping uh, support would mean. If it means um, essentially uh, withdrawing the sort of security guarantees that are intrinsic to NATO, we have got a really big problem, but I very much hope that it doesn't mean that. So let's just accept therefore a reality. Even if, even if Trump doesn't get in, um, uh, there's, there's a sufficiently active debate in Washington about this for Europe to have to understand that what you said is true. <laughs> Increasingly, we are going to have to take care of our own security. Now, um, I vehemently hope that that's never out of the context of this deep interdependence with America. But fundamentally, there's an up arrow next to Europe owning its own security. And that has got a whole set of implications. Not all of them bad, by the way. I, am, I have, I think, um, in a sense, Vladimir Putin has done us a favor. He's reminded us that we do need to take responsibility. 
And I think we're already a completely different place to we were. But, but the reality is um, we're going to have to take decisions. We're going to have to grow our defense capacity and capability. Um, we have, um, for instance, just seen the miraculous enlargement of NATO. So, you know, we have the structures to do this. But I think we're going to have to stand up. And that will be a question, of course, of political leadership, as I think you're saying, Thomas. But on, also, um, it's not like it's a difficult argument to sell. You know, this yeah. might have been an abstract idea two years ago. It really isn't now. Yeah. So uh, I have a feeling that regarding the U uh, Ukrainian war and the, the conflict on the Middle East, that it is the Europe who pays the price always. Always. <laughs> It's not the United States. What we should do to be better, what we should do to, to make things change, So, so the, are we lacking, uh, is it the politicians or is it the, the society, what is it? It's us. So this is the shift. There's been a shift. You know, the, this, this idea, I think in Europe we, we got um, carried away by the idea that we had tamed the forces of history We're in some postmodern period and we could afford to run down our military, increase our social spending. Uh, because um, the world was now a, a, a less dangerous place. Now, that was just wrong. What was actually going on is we were under a US security umbrella. Now, that is still a pretty formidable umbrella, but we're now discovering where the limits lie, and the US's ambitions are changing. So we, we now know that in, in the real world, um, our model is going to be contested more and more and more. And that if you take a simplistic view, uh, as in Germany, that you can take your security from America, your gas from Russia, and your market from China. <laughs> you know, that is effectively to ignore a whole set of geopolitical risks that come with that model that you can't ignore anymore. But we're all complicit in this, in the sense of the things we demand from our governments. So I think it's inevitably, it's going to take a while for reality to dawn. I, but I, I think, to go back to what I said at the beginning, there's also processes for remembering we have a set of things that make us really strong. So if you want me to know, if you want to say what worries me the most, it's not our ability to build up our defense industries and our military industrial complexes. I think, you know, we can do that. We've done it before. I, my, my view uh, is um, that it, uh, the, the real battle here is on the technology side. <laughs> and there are a set of technologies growing And the value system that dominates those will be the one that is, um, has the geopolitical power. And I think um, China has really worked that one out. It has a plan to dominate the key emerging technologies. America is now reacting. Where is Europe in this space? What are we actually doing to produce the next global innovations that will keep us at the front of this race? Because that is the thing that will give our kids choices. Yeah, no, I, I, it's it's where I wanted to, you know, um, aim the, the this next question because uh, obviously there's a strong correlation unless you are North Korea, uh, you know, between economic strength and strength of your business and capital markets and 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 uh, of course technologies and military might. Uh, I think the it's undisputable that U.S is managing those two things on, on the highest possible levels, mm. being having, you know, open market uh, economy and very strong innovation drive and investment in new technologies, and while at the same time maintaining strong military uh, might and, and presence all around the world. The, you know, the, the strange combination that China has, which is, you know, authoritarian, communistic, uh, I don't know how to describe it, like authoritarian societal, management uh, uh, with some mixture of free market mm -hmm. also proves that they're able in technology wise to be at the top of, of the development. Uh, the worry about Europe is, and we just recently had an interview with an energy expert that said, you know, Europe is losing this kind of source of growth. Uh, don't have any more, doesn't have any more friends in the, in the world. Uh, USA being a friend and competitor as well. 
Um, so wh where is this chance of finding this, uh, you know, so, so that the that the EU or Europe as, as a whole doesn't become some kind of a bumper area between two competing poles? Yeah. Um, well, look, uh, uh, there's, I think that's kind of the most important question of our time. This idea of whether China can sustain its innovative potential whilst also Xi Jinping repoliticizes China, closes down the yeah. private space even more, um, and um, uh, and reduces the scope for private initiative. It's, it's a really open question. <laughs> it's possible that that may be very difficult, but I don't think we should assume that China will fail because, as you say, it's bringing huge resources and a very long-term approach. I think the innovative power of US and its distri distributed system is, is undoubted. <laughs> and, and the issue is us in Europe. I, I, I did not vote for Brexit. I do not think Brexit is a good idea. But in this respect, I, I now encourage my government to be as different from Europe as it possibly can be. 